allow her to say her thing. But uh, so last time, thank you so much for your engagement in Brianna Lennon's class. Brianna, hello. <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, last time, uh, there were lots of questions online and lots of questions in person. And, you know, one thing about the hybrid environment, it's good to kind of have some structure to it to try to make it even. I think that Brianna was not able to get to a lot of the online questions and got to most of the ones in person. So to try to alleviate that, we're doing two things. One, Brianna's going to present for a little while and then have stopping points where she will say, now I will take questions. So if you wouldn't mind, please, Brianna will make that very clear. She's very clear in her presentation and we're really enjoying this, but so she'll present for a while and then say, um, now, does anyone have any questions? And during that time, as as well as she's able, she's going to try to break it between in-person and online. For the online people today, because there were so many questions, we're going to go in ahead and set it so it only comes to Brianna. So she can see those questions and she can decide which one she has time to answer. I, we will also, if there are many and you're not able to read everything, Brianna, we will, Jeff and I will send you a report on the chat after class so you can see what's going on. All right. Everyone clear on that? Any questions? All right. With that, I'll turn this over to Brianna. And I've got to turn on your microphone, Brianna. Why don't you see if you hear me? I hear myself. Yeah. Is that good? For <laughs> okay. okay. Take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming back. <laughs> um, today, this is the third of our fourth session. Um, so we're going to focus on election equipment and uh, kind of a little bit of the history, a lot of the history, because actually the history of election equipment is really interesting. From the floor, uh, because election equipment comes up in the news a lot, and then the testing verification process and all the requirements that go into using election equipment in the United States, but uh, specifically in Missouri. So um, laying the foundation, we're gonna talk a little bit about the history, the different types, the preparation, and then the effects on elections administration because the equipment has a big role to play, uh, but it is just one of many different layers of elections administration. So I just wanna talk about how, what type of equipment that we use has an impact on um, what voters see, how we have to structure our office, uh, and various other things that I think a lot of people don't always think go together in um, the, the kind of architecture of putting on an election. So first, uh, before we can even talk about tabulation, we have to talk about ballots. So is, has, have people seen this image before? It's very famous. So this is by George Caleb Bingham. Uh, it's from 1852. It was painted here in Columbia. It's currently it's hanging in the St. Louis Art Museum. But it's been used um, nationally. I've been at uh, presentations in different parts of the country that they use this for. And one of the reasons why it's so kind of ubiquitous of voting is because it encapsulates everything that happened in uh, the 17th, 18th century voting. Um, you've got alcohol, you've got somebody, uh, you know, swearing a pledge. Um, if you read the description of the actual artwork, the person up there that's in that red uh, with, the, with the person who has his hand up, that is an Irish immigrant that is swearing an oath and that he has not voted in an election uh, so that he still is uh, eligible to vote in this election. You've got a guy, presumably because he's had too much alcohol, who's being dragged um, you can see him over behind the person that's sitting at the table, but his hat is facing down, and there is a person carrying him into the polling place. Uh, these are all kind of signs of fraud and intimidation and incentivizing voters to vote the way that a candidate or a political party wanted them to vote. Uh, and you'll also notice who is missing from this picture. Women. There's no women. There are no people of color. It's very exclusionary. Uh, and that is how things were set up originally in American democracy. So I put those, um, I, there's a, there are three really great resources that I wanted to put on there. One is the uh, Smithsonian has a really fantastic exhibit that's up right now, and you can look at it on, online. They have a huge version of it online that talks about how 
the machinery of democracy has evolved over time. The MIT Election Lab has a nice little brief on voting technology over time. And then the Council of State Governments has a really good primer on it as well. So the thing to know about the history of ballots is that the original voting choice for people was to do a voice vote. Uh, it was not private. It wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't very or orderly. It was very loud and uh, led to a lot of people not being able to actually make their own voices heard because they were pressured to do other things. But that was how it originally started. There's really great conversations um, that you can find in history books about the legislators that were defending why the voice vote was the preferred way to do things because this is how we make our voices heard and how dare you get away from this by moving us to a ballot system. Um, but we had voice vote for a long time. And then when we stopped doing voice votes and we moved to ballots, we didn't jump immediately to, oh, the county clerk of whatever the county is is going to print these ballots. They were party ticket ballots. The candidates and the parties themselves were, were expected to create their own ballots. Uh, generally, they were different colors. The state law usually said they have to be a certain size, they have to be a certain text, and those kinds of things, but left everything else up to the different parties. And so if you were going to vote, you would bring your own ballot, and it may be, um, you know, printed in a certain way, but that would make tabulating really hard. It would make it really obvious who you were voting for, because you'd have the, the party ticket that you would want. Um, and it was not very uniform, so everybody had kind of a different experience when they went to go vote. In the late 1880s, we actually adopted what uh, Australia was doing. So the Southern Australian ballot is the official term of the ballot that we use now. It is a ballot that is created by a, a state official. It's consolidated, so it has every candidate, every party that you could possibly vote for, and it's standardized so that you don't have to have different ways of uh, casting ballots. And it helps lead the way towards a lot of the things that we do now, like ballot privacy and things like that. So um, conceptually, it really took until the late 1880s, the 1900s, for us to have the ballot in the form that we have now. And even then, this ballot didn't look exactly like what we do now. So let's jump to the 20th century. We've got full printed ballots. They're produced by election officials. The ballot is secret. Um, they're still in the beginning of the 20th century, there's still limited participation in elections because we don't have any, um, we don't have any uh, like civil rights acts or uh, women are still not voting. We're not to 1920 yet. There's a heavy political machine influence. So even though we've got these secret ballots that are nicely printed and the election judges have them, uh, political machines are really, really, uh, ingrained in what's happening, especially in urban areas. But um, we'll talk a little bit about Missouri's specific political machines in a second. And then you start to see, as uh, we start to try to figure out how to better tabulate these huge printed ballots, because the other difference is that we went from having, you know, this is a party ticket that only has three candidates on it, to here's the ticket that has all of the parties on it and all of the races on it. We've got to figure out a more efficient way of counting these. This is not working. So we start to see lever machines and punch cards start replacing hand counting. And the other thing that this, the other thing that this did uh, as we moved to lever and punch card machines is that people were starting to think about the process of voting a little bit differently as well. So does anyone know who this is? I don't think so this is Tom Bedriaft. He was, uh, I mean, he's notorious for leading the political machine in Kansas City for a long time um, in the early 1900s, 1920s, 1930s, uh, synonymous with voter intimidation. He would basically bribe and intimidate poll workers and election officials who were the people that were hand counting the ballots. And then he would get fraudulent vote totals to be reported. They would stuff ballot boxes, and it was uh, basically how people expected elections to be run at that time. And you started seeing some pushback and people saying, you know what, maybe we can have machines that help take care of this problem, that make it so that uh, it's less likely that a voter can be intimidated because they can't prove how they voted because it's fully secret. 
you can't buy off somebody to say, oh, yeah, there were definitely 50 ballots in that box. Um, there, the punch, even the punch and lever machines, one of the big advances that they had was that there was a number counter on them. So if you knew that 50 voters had come in, you could see the 50 votes were cast. Uh, that had not been done up until the point when machines started being created. So you start also seeing, these are from the 1950s, uh, different areas of the state, and I focus specifically on Missouri because I just really like these, that once uh, machines started to become popular and the legislature began to allow them to be purchased in the state of Missouri, people were advocating for why they would be preferred. And you can see on there the advantages are less election clerk expense. Well, that's true because we already know if you're going to have to have a bunch of people at a polling place to count ballots, you need far more than in this case, like right now, we send between five and six people out to do uh, polling place management. That's how many poll workers, election judges we send out. You need way more than that if you're going to count every ballot at the polling place, even in the 1950s when populations were much smaller. It's a secret ballot, so even though technically the South Australian ballot is a secret ballot because it's not a voice vote, it's not perfect because that ballot could be seen as you're holding it, if you're getting checked in, if you drop it into, um, you know, sometimes they use glass ballot boxes, you'd be able to see exactly how your ballot was cast. There was really nothing that prevented somebody, especially somebody that wanted to influence you into how to vote. Uh, to prevent them from letting them see how you voted, and the machine was one of the ways to do that. They were far more accurate. Um, aside from the, the fraudulent aspect of somebody could literally buy a vote, uh, people, humans, are just not great at counting stacks of paper. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, too, because we still do do that, but we do it as a check more than we do as our, our general process. And of course, it's faster. Um, it's way faster to use a machine to tabulate things. Um, and I think it's, it's interesting on here, the price for buying all the voting machines for the entire city of Springfield in 1950 was $140,000. I would love if that were the case now. Uh, you also see in St. Louis, St. Louis really did kind of, you know, maybe Springfield didn't have very much fraud happening in it, or they didn't want to say that in their editorials. But St. Louis doubled down and said, "Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna eliminate some of the fraud and some of the errors." And then they actually showed a difference of what they would look like. So you've got a tally sheet, and that tally sheet still exists. I actually have used a tally sheet like that before. On the bottom, um, that's what hand counting looks like when you're hand counting ballots versus the uh, tabulator where they're looking at buying these lever machines and um, those at the top are the, the 5A, 4A, 3A, 2A, those are the different precincts and the different numbers of votes that have been cast at them. So um, there was definitely kind of like we talked about last week about absentee voting, how people really have a uh, big influence on how their elections are run by making their voices heard on like well, we do like mail ballots, or we would rather do early voting or, or whatever, and you can see those shifts over time. Same thing with voting equipment. People started to make their concerns heard and said, you know what, if it means that my city has to shell out $140,000, that's fine for the peace of mind it buys me, that my vote is secret, and I feel like I have more confidence in our elections. So you started to see this, especially in Missouri in the 1950s, 1960s, and this was really the, the punch card lever vote system uh, that was taking hold at that time and kind of across the country too. Does anyone have questions up to this point on these things? Were there any close elections? Yeah, there were tons of close elections. And um, especially I think in the more urban areas where you had uh, a lot of power that was um, concentrated in smaller elections like mayoral races or precinct captain races where here you don't really think about like, well, who's your committee person on the central committee for the Democratic Party? Doesn't mean as much now as it used to. Those places had very close races all the time. And it was incredibly important who was on the central committee in those uh, cases. So a lot of the things that 
like Tom Pendergast did in Kansas City, was fixing those races so that he could have direct control over the political parties that were having direct control over the government at the time. And the same is true of Tammany Hall and stuff, but that was uh, earlier in time. Um, Missouri's tended to be in the in the early 1900s for some reason, going into the 1930s. Yep. When you get into the primary things like the, and the caucuses, it looks to me like they don't have a very good way of counting. Uh, they yes. don't count sometimes except they raise their hand. Yes. And I and I think that has been interesting. And at the end, I have some um, like things to noodle on kind of thing. And that's one of them is thinking about how uh, we're okay with accepting different ways of counting things, depending on what it is we're counting. Like people are fine with a caucus system that's privately run for the most part. Missouri excluded because we're new to the caucus system. But in Iowa, for example, they've had caucuses for forever. And while there may be a big push to election integrity for like the county clerks of Iowa to have a specific thing, nobody puts pressure on the political parties to change the way they do their caucus for fear of uh, lack of integrity. People are fine with that process. Um, so there's, it's just it's really interesting to kind of dive into the psychology of how people feel about how they're able to cast their ballot or if they have to do it by voice vote, vote like caucuses. So we've made it up to you know the 1950s, 1960s. Punch cards, lever systems, those are what's being used all throughout the United States, um, all the way up through 2000. And then the 2000 election really changes everything. There is a very bright line in elections administration. And people that you talk to that have worked in elections administration, the people that have worked in this field for 40 years will attribute everything to what happened in the 2000 election. And it gave us a good lesson in testing and maintaining voting equipment. So I am sure that everyone is very familiar with the hanging chad issue that happened. Um, in pre-2020, we're doing punch cards, lever machines, there's hand counting in small jurisdictions, and then there's optical scanners. So for the most part, people are using these punch card machines. The thing that uh, kind of gets left out of the conversation when you're talking about how these were problematic and how the hanging chad situation happened and how we had to have all of these experts looking at these ballots to see if they counted or not, is that all of this could have been alleviated if the county clerks that were using these machines cleared out the little gaps underneath the machines that held all the chads. And the testing and the logic and accuracy and the things that we do on our machines now, a lot of it came from looking at this and saying, see what happens when we don't have best practices? These few counties in Florida, and I've talked to other election officials that worked in Florida in 2000, and they were like, we always cleared this out. Like, we've never had this problem. And these other counties that just never thought about literally clearing out the chads that had been voted from other people in previous elections. It just never occurred to them that this could be a possibility. Um, so we get to this point. Everybody's focused on Florida. Everybody's focused on these punch cards. And then after 2000, we start seeing more optical scanners. We see direct recording electronic machines. And right now, we're on the second generation of post-2000 voting machines, optical scanners still, and ballot marking devices. So I'm going to go more in depth in these. This is just, I wanted to give everyone a lay of the land. This is how we think about voting machines. You've got 2000 and before, you've got 2000 and after. You've sort of got 2016, 2020 uh, as kind of the impetus into the second generation, because you'll notice I don't say that there are DREs in the second generation, and there's a reason for that. So after the uh, 2000 election, Congress, the president, everybody wanted to know how this was going to be fixed. And the way that they decided to make changes to elections administration is by passing the Help America Vote Act of 2002. And what this did, first and foremost, is that it created a grant program. And that money went from the federal government for the first time down to the states and then down to the local election officials to buy new equipment. Because a lot of places were using punch card and lever machines, not because they loved them so much, but because they couldn't afford anything else. 
But you also saw this really interesting change in the election and the voting machine uh, industry. Because previously, it was usually ballot printers that would, uh, you know, a, a local election authority would work with a ballot printer. There were, if you look back at different trademarks and patents that were held over time, you'll see like companies or one-off people would be like, I found the best new voting machine and they would create some sort of mechanism for that. Uh, but there was no money that was really flowing into the system. So it was really kind of like little inventors and tiny print shops. And that's who was able to provide these lever systems and punch cards. Well, now you had this huge cash infusion from the federal government, and you had these companies that started consolidating. And IBM wanted a piece of it. Um, Diebold wanted a piece of it. All these companies that were now like synonymous with, oh, I would never want them doing our voting equipment, they all wanted to get involved because the money was there. So you see all of this money coming in. Local election authorities for the first time have to start like really critically thinking about, okay, what's available, but the market's still really small, so there's not a lot of options. Help America Vote Act also required accessible voting equipment. Punch cards, lever machines, not super accessible. If you have any sort of uh, visual problems and you need help, um, it's not going to help you. You need somebody to read things to you and help you mark the lever machine. This required everybody to be able to vote independently, regardless of what their uh, ability was. And so that's why you started seeing some of these touchscreen, direct recording uh, equipment things, so that people could go and vote without having to ask somebody to mark their ballot for them um, or read their ballot to them. Because that really had, was an intrusion of privacy, it felt like. So uh, Help America Vote kind of moved in the direction. We already had the uh, the ADA. It wasn't super old by that time. It was only in existence for about 10 years by the time HAVA happened. Uh, so it started getting incorporated into elections. It also created the Federal Election Assistance Commission. This is really important because at the federal level, the Election Assistance Commission is the body that is tasked with creating any sort of guidelines regarding voting equipment. So up to this point, it was a totally open market. There were no regulations or standards about how the equipment was to be made, how it would have operated, how it should be used, how to test it. All of that was just completely open to interpretation. And so sometimes machines worked and sometimes they didn't, but there was no standard to weigh them against. The Election Assistance Commission has completely changed that and continues to, and has created these voluntary standards that now the companies that create this equipment uh, go to the Election Assistance Commission first, and there's a whole network of um, regulations and things that they work through so that they can get their machines to the market. It also created the concept of provisional ballot. That's not super relevant to voting machines, but I just like to put in people's minds that the fact that I can give you a provisional ballot if I can't determine your eligibility didn't exist till 2002. Up till that point, if you went to a poll and said, hey, I'm registered to vote and I'd like to vote today, and somebody had mistakenly taken you off the roll, you had no recourse at all. Um, there was so much of that that happened in 2000 that because they were already having a conversation in Congress about how to overhaul a lot of election reform, um, this was one of the things that made it into the final Help America Vote Act, so that people could have an opportunity to be able to vote, even if they didn't have all of their eligibility, um, even if the ballot didn't end up counting, at least there was a process in place. Up to then, there was no process in place. It also required the centralized statewide voter registration database. And this is extremely important because also up to this point, everybody had their own voter registration database. And regardless of whether you were a small town with 200 people or a huge um, municipality with 2 million people, you had your own statewide registration database. None of them talked to each other. Uh, moving, it's, it's very similar if you were at the conversation we had about how right now, like I can see that somebody's registered in Callaway if they come in here, then I can just bring them into Boone County. There was no um, visibility like that. 
So if you were registered in Callaway, it was likely that if you moved to Boone and got registered in Boone, you'd be registered in both. Even though we were right next to each other, there was no way for us to be able to see that. So um, this was one of the, the processes to making sure that our voter rolls were clean too, uh, as one of the other moving parts of the elections administration reform. So what that ended up looking like, and I don't expect you to, to read <laughs> something so, so uh, crazy, um, but I did want to point out, there is an excellent resource if you care about how every single jurisdiction in the country uses election equipment. Verified Voting is a nonprofit that is uh, kind of like a watchdog for when it comes to voting machines, and they have compiled an entire uh, survey, and they... They reach out to me every election to make sure that they still have our information correct about what type of voting machines each municipality uses. So this is the first time that they collected it. This is from November of 2006. So for the election of 2006, after Help America Vote Act passes and we have um, this cash infusion shifting down, um, previous to this point, obviously, there were lever machines and punch cards, and those were still in existence. There were still local election authorities that wanted to keep those. They didn't really see any problem with them, slash they didn't have the money yet because the state was still holding on to it to be able to make the change fast enough to be in effect for um, 2006. But uh, you're starting to see all these counties adopting DREs. And what DREs are, are direct recording electronic machines. Um, we'll get into it a little bit more, but you can see how prevalent they are. Um, all of the red areas are ones where the primary ways of people voting are by using these touchscreen direct recording devices. They don't have any other option, that's just what they have. Uh, you can see we are in green, we're kind of in light green and dark green, but what that means is that we're primarily using hand-marked paper ballots, but we also have direct recording uh, electronic devices. And those direct recording electronic devices were required in some form, even the, either that or a ballot marking device, which is what BMD stands for, because of the accessibility requirement of the Help America Vote Act. So everybody had to have something, but it didn't all have to be the same thing. So we start seeing DREs, uh, prevalent across certain states, but in a lot of areas. Um, and some of the states, like, uh, you'll see, and this is important for thinking about how the things are the way that now, because of how voters feel about the type of equipment they have. In 2006, in the entire state of Georgia, everybody is voting on touchscreen machines. VVPAT stands for Voter Verified Paper Audit Trail. So that means that they're voting on all of these machines and there is no paper backup for it at all. The only thing that they have is a little um, memory card at the end of the night and that says, here's all of our votes. All of our votes are on this memory card. We have nothing to compare it to. We have no other ballots, but we have this. Uh, and you can see that a lot of the big counties in Texas have that too. So a lot of the big population areas have these um, machines with no paper backup whatsoever. Um, and then for whatever reason, the entire state of New York kept with their mechanical lever machines. Uh, they don't have those now, but they, New York really liked lever machines for a long time. <laughs> so I'm also not expecting you to read this tiny thing, but as, as HAVA happens, and we're buying our equipment in 2006, one of the reasons why we are a green area and not a red area is because when our legislature looked at the Help America Vote Act, they said, yeah, I can get behind this, but I want to add some additional safeguards. So while we still get to have the accessibility equipment and we are still required to have voting in absolute secrecy, we instituted a law that also required a paper trail for any direct recording electronic machine. So that's why anybody that voted in Missouri from 2006 all the way through, a lot of people haven't updated their equipment um, where they're just finishing up. Uh, for the last 
what, 18 years, we have always had a paper trail. So even though a memory card would come out of the machine where people were casting their ballots on the touchscreen, there'd be a roll of tape on the side that would also show what the voters picked. And you'd be able to cross-reference those to make sure uh, if you had a recount, you could look at that paper instead of having to rely on the memory stick. Yes? That's part of the show me state, is it? It is part of the show me state. <laughs> Uh, so not only that, we also added a certification process at the state level. So while, like I said, the Election Assistance Commission has a full rigorous testing certification program, it is completely voluntary. It is up to the states, because of our decentralized elections, to adopt whether uh, machines that are sold in that state have EAC certification. We wanted to make sure that EAC certification was required. So Missouri does require every piece of equipment sold in the state to have certification done by the Election Assistance Commission. But we have a second layer where the Secretary of State's office also has to certify the equipment. So um, many states have that, not all of them, uh, but it's one of the ones that, it's, it's one of the safeguards that we added at the same time that HAVA was passed. So it wasn't, we were ahead of the curve for a lot of different states to make sure that we had both paper and certification at the state level. We also have requirements uh, that none of these machines can be connected to the internet and that they're air-gapped. That existed, I think it existed more in implication in the state law until more recently in 2018, 2019. It was uh, written into the statute that said, they have to be air gapped. And air gap just means that if, like this device right here, this computer is connected to the internet, if I stick a USB drive in here and then I take it out and I go put it in a, my voting equipment computer that has never been connected to the internet, I have now uh, tainted my non internet connected device by putting something into it that was connected to something that was in the connected to the internet. So air gap just means. I can never put something in a non-connected to the internet device that has been connected to the internet before. So we don't want to spoil anything. And then the machines themselves do not have modems in them, cannot be connected to the internet. And uh, that, again, we're ahead of the curve because that is not necessarily true for all of the states. Some states have allowed modems to be in their machines because they transmit their results at the end of the night because they might be in a really, really rural area and it takes five hours to get back from their polling place to the seat, to the county seat. And so they allow them to send their, their results over the internet with the expectation that they're driving five hours back and they will get all of the results. They're gonna still get all of the ballots and all of the actual results, but it's faster if you just let them uh, shoot them to you over the internet. We uh, don't allow that. We've never allowed that. I don't think we will ever allow that. And then finally, we also have requirements in our law to do um, pretty extensive logic and accuracy testing. And that just means that whatever the equipment is that we have, when we buy it and it gets delivered to us, just because we test it when we get it and make sure that it works appropriately, doesn't mean that we don't have to test it ever again. Before every election, we have to go through rigorous testing to make sure it's still working properly, it's still counting properly, it hasn't been compromised, um, and that it's going to correctly record every voter's ballot. Any questions on what Missouri does? Yes. Um, is that law 115.225? Yes. Okay. And also, <clears throat> that map you had with the green and red? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was interesting to me that the red was a lot in the south. Yes, <laughs> it is. And I should have, I haven't, um, I haven't looked at exactly why that is. I'm sure there are some interesting reasons for it. I couldn't find anything specific to what they did before they moved to fully electronic. Um, anecdotally, Anybody that I've talked to in these areas, it's really interesting because voters love them because they're faster. So even though it sounds incredibly scary to say, well, you don't have a paper trail and all that kind of stuff, if you voted on one of our touchscreens that was a direct recording electronic device, 
you pick a selection and you hear to the printer go, and then you do another thing and go, and you'd have to wait every time because you'd have to have the printer printing in real time what you were selecting. For people voting in Georgia or South Carolina or Tennessee, they would just pick it and move on, pick it and move on. It was so fast and voters loved it. And a lot of voters still love it, especially because most people are not really thinking about like all of the mechanisms of elections. They just want to get in and out of their polling place as fast as possible. So it wasn't something that, you know, when this happened, people thought, oh my gosh, it's like a whole new world and this is really scary and we have no regulations on this. They were like, hey, this is way better than having to do that punch card thing we were doing before. We can just pick our options. This is fantastic. So, yeah, I... I would love to look more into why that is. I have a feeling it's because um, a lot of these states, ours included, if you start looking at like the northern and western areas, a lot of the states were just really used to hand marking ballots and wanted to use those. But there's probably also a fair amount of um, resource allocation. And uh, for Georgia in particular, Georgia's voting equipment is purchased by the Secretary of State's office. So when Georgia got its money, it could spend it immediately instead of having to distribute it to all the different counties. Missouri is not like that. Every county in Missouri gets to pick their own voting equipment. It has to be approved, like it has to be preliminarily approved. So when I buy equipment, I don't have to have the Secretary of State's office say, yes, you can buy that equipment. They just give me a piece of paper that says, you can buy these five, five kinds of equipment and then I just go buy them. Um, but the decentralized nature means it would take longer for us to get the money from the state that came from the federal government. And so that may slow things down too. You and then you. So. I can't quite see uh, how what the color of New York and Connecticut uh, means. It may be written down below, but I can't read it. So it is mechanical lever machines. So it means that uh, New York and Connecticut were very slow in adopting any new technology. Yes. What happens to these machines in between elections? Where are they stored? That is a great question. So for the people on the um, online, uh, what happens to the machines when they are stored? So it is very variable depending on what the county has available. For us, we have a fantastic warehouse out by the jail, by the sheriff's office, and that is where we keep the equipment. Some counties, uh, especially if the equipment is purchased by the Secretary of State's office, the Secretary of State's office holds it in their warehouses, and they just deploy them to the counties when they need them, but normally they just hang on to them. Some counties rent them, so uh, they have rental agreements with the companies that they get the equipment from. So the companies themselves hold on to the equipment until they need it for an election. Uh, and then a lot of counties just make do with what they have. And so you'll find in some smaller counties, I've been to smaller counties in uh, northern Missouri where they just have a supply closet that they keep locked and that's where they keep their voting equipment because they may only have two pieces of voting equipment because there's so few people that live there, they only have one polling place that opens. So they just don't have that much of it. We have uh, 100 DS200s, which are pretty big and um, need a lot of space. So it's really dependent on um, how the state interacts with the local government and then also what kind of resources the local government has at their disposal. There are other questions about, yes. And, and this is more, are those states that have a wide variety of different types of equipment, is that an issue for those states or do you know? Um, I'm looking at, in particular, I guess, Iowa and Texas. Um, so while it looks like Iowa and Texas have, and this is still from 2006, but while it looks like they have incredibly diverse ways of doing things, mm -hmm. and they do, um, it kind of masks the fact that so does Missouri. So even though we're all green because we're using the same general kind of equipment, we're not using the same manufacturer. So it doesn't cause problems for us uh, because we don't have to have all of the equipment, like 
Um, in some states, uh, Maine, for example, you can see all has the same color. They actually do have the same equipment because all the ballots in Maine are sent back to the Secretary of State's office to be centrally counted. So they have to have the same equipment because they have to have the same specs for their ballots and everything else has to be programmed perfectly and uh, the same. So if we were, that I would say, somebody asked on the um, chat before with the, uh, in one of the previous sessions, how ranked choice voting kind of fits into this. Ranked choice voting is impacted explicitly by this. Because if you're trying to do ranked choice voting on the state level, that means you've got to be able to take all the results from the entire state and mash them together in one tabulation system. We do not have that capability in Missouri because you can't take the USB drive that I have for my Express for my uh, ES and S <coughs> machines, and then take a Dominion one and put them into the same machine to be counted the same way because that's not going to work. They're proprietary software. Um, so it does have a big impact on things, uh, even though on like a voter side of things, it doesn't really impact them too much. And speaking of that, somebody asked about our election night results. We do not use election night results software, so that's also really important. Um, the election results that we get come directly out of these machines, and they come in PDF and then we just put the PDF up on the website. So um, there is no like external results going on anywhere. All the results are kept in-house. Uh, there's no real server. There's the laptop. There's the computer terminal that, it, that the uh, software is on that has the tabulation in it. And then um, that's where the results from the USB sticks from the machines themselves go into that, and they are not used for anything other than what's in the uh, like the machine itself and that computer. They don't ever get used for anything else. They are specifically for that, so they never touch the internet. So this is an example of what we saw in 2006. If you have used, if you use the equipment in 2006, um, the image on the top there is the optical scanner, and an optical scanner is really the same as any other optical scanner in any other capacity, so Scantron tests that kids take in high school, all of those things are um, considered optical scanners, so that's why when you're marking your ballot and you're marking a little circle on it, it's counting it just like you would if you were taking a standardized test. Um, but you can see there's a very small LED screen. So if there's an error on your ballot, it's really tiny and hard to see. Um, and then on the bottom there, that is the uh, ESNS direct re recording electronic machine, which was called the iVotronic. Uh, it was colloquially called the iVote. And not only was it allowing people to select their choices on it, but it was also adding together those results too. So the other thing that happened that would make it very complicated is that the poll workers at the end of the night would have to pull the memory sticks out of both of those machines. And so that took way longer too, because you'd have to have two sets of memory sticks being accumulated together at every single polling location. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice is that these don't look like, you know, the latest technology, even in 2006. In 2006, we had iPhones and a whole bunch of other very, like, good technology. Um, but because it took so long for the industry to really catch up to things and then work its way through the regulations and try to figure out the best way to do this, um, even though they were bought brand new in 2006, they basically had 2001, 2002 operating technology on them. And with as fast as technology moves, it didn't make them uh, great. It just made them what was available. So this is what we used from 2006 all the way through 2019 in Boone County. Um, somebody asked if there are different tabulators and models being used in Missouri, and that is true. So ESNS is the one that we use. Uh, Dominion also has equipment that looks very similar to this. 
Uh, there's a company called Unison that has equipment that's very similar to this and Heart Inner Civic. So there are a number of options for different counties to buy different equipment. We originally bought ES&S and then um, in 2019, over time, technology became outdated. We put out a bid uh, and we did public demonstrations at the ARC so that poll workers and members of disability groups could come in and kind of play with the different companies that bid on us. And we had three, Unison, Dominion, and es &S. And they all have a variation of this kind of equipment. So we moved from, um, we still have optical scanners. We just moved from having ones with tiny little devices on them, tiny little screens on them that really didn't tell the voter anything to this one that'll tell the voter anything that's wrong with the ballot. And then we moved from having a DRE-based uh, touchscreen to a touchscreen that marks a piece of paper that that gets put into the optical scanner. So now every ballot that gets cast, regardless of whether you use the touchscreen or you hand mark a paper ballot, it's all actually tabulated by the optical scanner. So there's only one set of uh, results at the end of the night, and they're on a single USB stick. For um, just kind of performance-wise, it improved the voter experience, uh, lets us have paper ballots only, and it improved the reliability. You can imagine after using the same equipment for uh, 13 years, it was breaking down. It required a lot of maintenance. This, uh, I mean, we've been using it for five years has not broken down, has not really needed anything other than just periodic annual maintenance. Um, you got to clean out the, the head of it that is looking at the ballots. The old machines, too, were very, very sensitive to ink. And so if somebody was voting really quickly and went to go put their ballot in the machine and the ink hadn't dried yet on the ballot, it would get on the scanner, the optical scanner, and then it would cause an error because the scanner would be covered in ink. Um, new optical scanners don't have that problem. So technology has just gotten better kind of all around. So this is what we use now in Boone County and in a number of the surrounding counties as well. And so you can see there's a lot less red now. These are the, uh, these are now what's gonna be used for November of 2024. So going into the 2024 election, you can see the industry has kind of uh, shifted back towards everything being either hand marked or using ballot marking devices. But this is why I said specifically, uh, look at Georgia, because Georgia went from having DREs with no paper trails to 100% ballot marking devices. And that on the bottom right there, the, um, the express vote, that's a ballot marking device. So if you go to vote in Georgia, you don't have an option of just having a piece of paper that you mark with a pen. This is the only option for you when you go to vote. But because Georgians were so used to doing a touch screen, they don't mind that this is all they have. If I told everybody, hey, you only ever get to vote on this machine, I'm never giving you a ballot again, there would be outrage. And so a lot of it is just what people are used to. And you can see same thing in Texas. Texas is slowly moving away from um, the DREs, but they're moving towards ballot marking devices. These are not places that are moving specifically to hand mark paper ballots because they're just not used to it. And the offices themselves may not have procedures in place to be used to doing those things either. You can see that there are still some states that have DREs without voter verified paper trails. It's very, very small. It's 1.6% of all of the country. So uh, even for the people that are using dairies, a lot of them are still using paper trails. Uh, and I am, I would say 99.9% .9 confident that anybody that's still using dairies without a paper trail, it's not because they've decided to do that. They don't want to do that. They may be lacking resources. Um, there has been no, this is, um, and I mentioned this on the other one, new equipment was purchased from county funds. There is no federal money coming down for these. So even though when we bought all this equipment in 2006, it was 100% federally funded, to buy all of the same replacement equipment, which is not cheap, we spent $900,000 on this equipment, uh, 
a lot of these counties don't have that kind of money to just come up with to replace equipment. So they are, some of them are buying replacement parts on eBay. Um, they're just doing whatever they can to get along until their county has enough money to replace these. So when you see things like how uh, secretaries of state and local election authorities are going to the federal government and pleading for uh, funding for things, that's why. It's because one cash infusion in 2006 was expected to last forever, um, and it doesn't. So this is where we're at now. Uh, I think a lot more people are comfortable looking at this as well because you can see that the vast majority, vast, vast majority, um, are either using ballot marking devices or hand marked paper ballots and ballot marking devices. So that's over, what is that, 89, over 90% of the country has a paper ballot backup. So if there's a recount that happens, if there is a close election, you can go back to the paper ballot and verify everything and you're not just relying on an electronic um, readout of what the results were. Um, so I wanted to go briefly just in, in a little more depth into how these machines, we make sure that they are accurate. So once we are in election prep mode, all of these pieces of equipment are tested with logic and accuracy testing. We have our bipartisan team come in, they create a test deck of ballots. So they take the ballots and they mark, they hand mark on every single ballot of every type that can be used in the county. And then they run it through the machines and make sure that the machine count matches the count that they know to be true from creating the test deck. And that has to be a perfect match before we can um, allow them to be used in an election. And then once they've been tested, they all get sealed up and signed off on by those bipartisan teams. And there's a chain of custody procedure for all of the voting equipment and the ballots and the supplies. So we have inventory tag numbers on all the machines, we record that in our office, and then the poll workers themselves verify them before and after the election. The voting equipment, the ballots, and the supplies are also sealed with tamper evident number tags. And then we have a series of checklists and forms to uh, make sure that we have chain of custody throughout the day so that at the end of the night, when the judges are closing down the polling place, they know that everything throughout the day has been checked as well. Um, for our county, we have one tabulator at each polling location. So usually uh, we have purchased a hundred of them. So that's how many we have in our inventory. Excuse me, but that can be for this election, we've got 44 elections or 44 polling places for April 2nd. So 44 of these machines will go out. For November election, when we have 70 plus polling locations, then 70 of these will go out. Um, and that is for our, our population, our voting, age, our voting population is about 120,000 uh, registered voters. So at our polling locations, we try to estimate about 2,000 voters turning out at each location. Um, so that's why also we go from 44 up to over 70, because when turnout's higher, you get to 2,000 a lot faster, so you need more locations. Um, and, uh, oh, and somebody asked about who pays for the cost of these things. And while we did purchase the equipment with, um, with county general revenue money, so it was, it was general revenue, uh, and then um, for every election, there's proportional costs. So districts that put things on the ballot, they pay into the election as well. Uh, and the poll workers, the bipartisan teams that go out to do this testing are considered part of the election cost. So that's all included in the election cost formula um, for every election. Does anyone have questions about this process? I know we kind of touched on it in the last one as well, but um, this is all before election day. Mm -hmm. Um, so, well, before I get to things to know on, I'll just say, after election day, one of the things that we do to make sure that 
uh, everything was done correctly. So our poll workers will take the USB drives out of these machines at the end of the night. The bipartisan supervisor teams at each polling place will drive together back to our office to hand us the tabulator, um, the tabulator results on the USB sticks. Those are put into the um, standalone computer that tabulates all of those. And those are our official election results. But while we trust that the machines are going to tabulate correctly and efficiently enough to be able to say, yes, these are our preliminary unofficial results on election night, we want to make sure that they're correct too. So what we do is take a um, random, and this is required in the law, so every county does this, a random 5% of our precincts, um, a bipartisan team will hand count all of the ballots from those 5% of the precincts, and they'll do them for every race. So they may count the same 500 ballots three different times because they're going to count the Board of Education race, and then they're going to count the City Council race, and then they're going to count the ballot measure race. And they have to make sure it's correct every single time. Um, it is a long process. Hand counting is not uh, quick or efficient. But it is important to check to make sure that everything that we tabulated on election night is correct. So uh, as long as the hand count matches exactly what we got on those tabulated results, then we consider that a success. It has to be 100% match for everybody, and um, it always has been. We haven't had any issues about it, and I haven't heard of any other counties having an issue with it either. But um, it's an important part of the process that a lot of people don't really no happens, although, uh, and I, I mentioned this on the next part, it is publicly open. Both the testing and the hand canning certification after election day, both of those are still open to the public, and we do them in, um, well, the testing happens out at our warehouse. So you can come out to the warehouse, you'll feel very secure because it's right next to the sheriff's office. Uh, but the the post certification, all of the um, hand counting happens in a room in our office that is all glass. So you can, you don't even have to be in the room if you don't want to be. You can just stand in the window and watch the entire thing happen. But it is all open to the public. Rihanna? Yes. In recent years, has anybody ever alleged that the votes in Missouri were not counted? No. Personally? Okay. Good. Yes. No, um, nobody has, has alleged any incorrect results that have come back. And uh, we've seen sort of an uptick in people that are interested enough to watch certification because it's pretty boring to watch people count <laughs> ballots over and over again. Um, but sometimes people want to come and see it happen. Uh, I get a lot of questions about it. Most often I get people that call and ask questions and then they don't show up. And that's always sad because I really want to have a conversation with somebody about it because I think it's fun. Yes, back there. What if you did find an irregularity? What would you do? There are statutes and regulations that kind of dictate what happens if you find an irregularity. Um, one of the uh, one of the things can be an election contest, and so it may go to court. If there's an irregularity, I can also go petition the court uh, and let them know that I found an irregularity. And generally, it would mean a redo of the election. Um, but thankfully, we haven't had any of those situations happen. Uh, and like I said, too, um, and it's one of the considerations on here, the equipment itself is just one of many other parts. So if I find an irregularity in the machines, I'm going to look at the whole rest of the election. It's not just going to end there. I'm going to look to make sure that there wasn't an issue at that polling place that the election judges had something happen that they didn't tell me about. Because um, it may be that the irregularity is like, uh, there's five ballots that weren't counted properly, and the election judges may say, oh yeah, five people came in and they left their ballot and we forgot to spoil them. Um, because what they're supposed to do is if somebody casts a ballot and then they just leave, which happens more often than you would think. Um, they leave it on their table, or uh, we've had people stand up and just tear their ballot up in the middle of the room, throw it on the floor, and walk out. <laughs> Those are supposed to be spoiled ballots. If, for whatever reason, the election judges got distracted or something happened and those five ballots instead um, ended up somewhere where they shouldn't have been, that could be an irregularity. So 
all we would still be able to find them because every chain of custody form, every ballot that gets issued, and all of the testing of the voting equipment all leaves it so that we can play back the story of election night without um, meeting the people there. We can read it on the forms. So uh, that's part of the reason we have so many forms so that we can recreate what happened. I'm not sure if this got answered. When you're doing the hand counted counting in the glass room, yeah. is that like at two o'clock in the morning? No, <laughs> no, the hand counting. So the hand counting that happens for the um, certification process, we usually start that. Uh, we by law we can't start it until afternoon on the Friday after the election. Okay. So we may do it in the afternoon on Friday. More generally, we end up doing it on the Monday or Tuesday following the election. We are required to put a public notice. So we always have a public notice up. Um, and it's usually at like 9 o'clock in the morning we'll start, and then it'll go all day till we're done. So it's not like everybody returns their ballots and then you have to do it that no. night? No. Okay. No, no, no. We do not do it on the same night as the election. Uh, everybody gets to go home and sleep so that we have a fresh set of eyes on the um, process. And then, um, oh, somebody else asked about um, testing for the April 2nd election happened uh, last week. We had our bipartisan team come out and do that and uh, certified everything that it was all counting correctly, counting correctly. And that process gets signed off on by both the Republican and Democrat before it gets uh, closed up. And I'm gonna, talk about the things to noodle on, and then I'm going to talk about one more issue related to election equipment. But generally, the things that you have to think about from the election side, when you're thinking about voting equipment and whether it's useful or not, the United States has the longest ballots of any other democracy in the world, partly because we really like democracy here. Um, the joke is that we elect our dog catcher. That is not the case in every other democracy. I mean, even robust democracies like Australia, where we got the Australian ballot from, they are not electing every layer of government. They don't have federalism the same way that we do. So we've got local races, state races, federal races, and in consolidated elections, like a November election, all three of them show up. So in some cases, we've been thankful to avoid this. But in some cases, people have to go in and vote on two pieces of paper as ballots because that's how long the ballot is. And it's front and back, two pages. If you can imagine taking all of those ballots and then hand counting them, uh, we would be counting them for weeks and months. So that's one of the reasons when people say, well, they do it in Ireland or they do it in Germany and things like that. That's because when Ireland has an election, it's for one person. And it just says, who would you like to be? your uh, your state person, your equivalent of them. Um, and that's all you have an option for. And so then it's just like a yes and no. And because of that, uh, you know, I don't think you talk to any election administrator that would say, if we had a ballot like that, we'd still definitely use machines. Obviously, you can, you can have some wiggle room if you've only got one question. We did that in Ashland. We had an election in February in Ashland. There was a yes or no question. Um, about whether to issue some bonds. And partly because it was in February before the April election and we didn't want to go through the entire logic and accuracy testing for one election in February in Ashland, and partly because we knew that when it's just a yes or no, we don't even have to contact our ballot printer. We just printed them on our own machine. We printed them on our copier. It was a yes or no, and people literally just checked yes or no. And at the end of the night, the election judges at the polling place put them in two separate piles, yes and no, and used that tally sheet that you saw in the beginning that St. Louis wanted to get rid of in the 1950s, and that's what we used to count the ballots. But there were 250 ballots cast, and it still took us over an hour to count them all, because it just takes a really long time to count ballots, even if there's one issue. So ballot length is a huge uh, consideration when you're talking about how to effectively do tabulation. And then you've got voter expectations, which we talked about earlier. The decentralized nature means there's particular ways of voting. Um, in St. Louis County, for example, and this is also related to 
the industry and how fast it's moving and things like that. I bid out my equipment in 2019 and I had ESNS, Unison, and Dominion bid on us. St. Louis County put theirs out around the same time as us. There was a fourth company called Heart Inner Civic, which has been used all over the country, um, but had never been used in Missouri. And so it was literally going through the certification process with the Secretary of State's office in 2019 while this was happening. They hit their RFP at just the right time that Hart bid on them. And Hart's equipment looked very different than ours because Hart's equipment is fully valid on demand. So if you go to vote in St. Louis County now, because they ended up picking it, you get checked in the same way that I would get checked in in Boone County. But instead of somebody handing you a ballot, there is an off-the-shelf printer sitting next to the poll worker, and the ballot prints out for them, and they hand it to you. And so there are no pre-printed ballots in St. Louis County. What that means is that they were then allowed, because of the freedom that that offered them, to say, you don't have to be assigned to a polling place now. If you want to vote in Ashland, the poll worker can print out your Columbia ballot for you. That's no problem. If we wanted to do that, the only two ways to do that would be to provide every single ballot style to every single polling place, which would be wild and extremely expensive, <laughs> or require everyone to use the ballot marking devices. And so there are places like Georgia that say you have to use the ballot marking devices. But what that allows them to do is like what St. Louis County does. So all these things are all considerations, but what voters' expectations are limit what types of changes um, a local election authority can really make to the way that voting happens. So um, machines are one part of that, but not the only part of that. And then uh, the same with the election structure. If you're in a state that has early voting and they require every ballot style during every early voting experience, you're going to have a different experience. They're going to want ballot marking devices. Georgia has early voting. They want ballot marking devices. They might have ballot on demand, but um, for the most part, ballot marking devices is how those counties have chosen to comply with having that early voting requirement. Election result timing. Optical scan machines are just faster. They count faster, they count more accurately. Um, that's why we test the crap out of them to make sure that they're doing it correctly, but they are faster. And then redundant processes. Uh, voting machines are one part of the layered election process. So if you are at a polling place and that machine goes down, it doesn't mean everybody stops voting. You can still vote. We've got the paper ballot. Um, you could still put all the paper ballots in a box and you would still have voted and it won't have changed anything. So voting machines are a convenient tool, but they are not the end of the world if they don't work. That's not necessarily the case if you were going to say, hey, you can only use a ballot marking device if you don't have any backup ballots. But that's why we make sure that we have redundant processes. If there's a machine that's compromised, we've got temper, tamper evidence seals on them so that election judges can see that there's been a problem. And the election judges themselves are a safety protocol because they can witness whatever's happening. So if somebody comes in to tamper with a the machine, they're going to see that happen. At least one of them is going to see something happen. And then finally, public participation. Every part of this is public. And so having uh, the public participate is one of the safety mechanisms that we have. Uh, and one of the reasons why we try to encourage people to come to these because it helps make sure that people then get to see behind the scenes, know how the process works, and um, answer any questions that people do have. So the last thing, yeah, the last thing I really want to talk about, I'm going to answer this question real quick in the um, chat. So, uh, and this is somewhat related. So. One of the things that happens with voting machines is that obviously, like with any piece of software, we get the results and we get um, total results for how the race turned out. And that's what we put out. There's other things that the machine is doing. So like the tabulators, when we put the results back in, it has more than just the, like, this is a yes vote and this is a no vote. It also has things like, uh, you know, oh, there was a write-in on that ballot? Well, here's an image of the write-in. 
So that way, when we are adjudicating ballots at the end of the night or during certification, we can visually see all the write-ins on the screen, which is fantastic. You don't have to go look for every individual ballot with a write-in on it. Uh, one of the other things it does is create this cast vote record. Um, and the cast vote record is like an Excel spreadsheet of every single ballot and how it was counted and what time it was counted and where it was counted. It doesn't have identifying information on it. The concern, um, if you've heard about the kind of debate about cast vote records, is that if you take publicly available information, like, oh, I saw so-and-so go into the ARC at 920, which means they cast their ballot at 920, and I have the cast vote record, and it says at 920 at the ARC this, ba this ballot was cast, I can then see how that person voted. So there are some um, privacy concerns and then there's also legal questions about it because the cast vote record is not really something that's ever been used for anything. We don't use it to check anything. It's not entirely helpful um, when it comes to hand counting and things like that. Like if you've already got the paper ballot, the cast vote record, not super helpful because we're going to rely on the paper record. Um, but there are some states that put it out there, like put the cast vote record online. Missouri is in a gray area where no court, <laughs> kind of come up in court in Greene County, but the court did not make a ruling on whether it is a public record or not. So for now, I think most people err on it being not a public record. We've erred on it not being a public record because we don't have any guidance on what the appropriate protocols would be to make it so that that privacy is still maintained. So um, those are things that come up sometimes. And then uh, the other thing that has come up a lot, which I feel like I'd be remiss, I know that I only have a minute, is hand counting is obviously something that has been coming up a lot as an alternative to voting, um, using voting machines. And I did bring um, Osage County in April of 23, did do uh, kind of a pilot of hand counting their entire election. And I brought the uh, very, very long article that the clerk for that county wrote about how the experience went. Um, and the summary of it did not go well. And that if, <laughs> if you were going to do it, uh, she needed like triple the number of election judges in order to do it. And even then, the last set of election judges that came back, came back at 1030 at night. Um, so, from a resource standard standing, from a efficiency, from an accuracy, uh, it was just not super helpful. Um, and ironically, like if you look back at the history of the adoption of voting machines, that's one of the reasons people moved to voting machines and got away from hand counting was because of the accuracy and the speed and the security of them. So um, that has come up quite a bit. Uh, I don't want to delve too much into it, but I did bring copies of it because I just think it's an interesting read from her. Um, and, uh, yeah, the anticlimactic, I'm sorry, but <laughs> it's, it's 260, and if, if people do have additional questions, I'm, I'm happy to talk about them if you all want to talk about it more, but, um, yeah, that's why we use voting machines in this country. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? I just find it interesting that Australia, South Australia, um, had the voting machine or the standardized ballot. Uh, but they also had women. Yes. Yeah. Voted. <laughs> yeah, Australia. Yeah. Australia has had a. Uh, South Australia, though. Yes. Yeah. 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 It was a very, very. Um, I would say their their definition of democracy was a lot more comprehensive than ours was took a long time for us to catch up with what they already had. I know you covered this last time, but if somebody asked me what's the difference between early voting and absentee, I, I didn't want to say anything because I didn't think I understood. So the biggest difference that we have here, that the difference between absentee and early voting, is that you're not going to see the results of the absentee um, ballots until election day, until election night, when it's all done. Okay. Um, and 
other than that, it really is pretty similar. It's it's a lot more just about the difference in legal definition than it is about a voter's experience. Um, so technically, we would not call it early voting, but from a voter's perspective, it feels the same. So Missouri technically doesn't have early voting. <clears throat> we have no excuse to absentee voting. Thank you all. I think if you didn't make it so easy, probably, probably wouldn't, people wouldn't vote. Brianna, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, and we will see everyone again in two weeks.